Uh, just to let you know, uh, SX is uh, a vision of higher education originated in France in 1907. Uh, developed many center of excellence in Europe. And some of these uh, centers that we usually call institutes already uh, some existence here in Asia as branch of three uh, organized uh, institutes operating in the region. One of these institutes that uh, we are starting to make real uh, uh, in the region is the Institute for Strategic Innovation and Service Is it? Uh, this institute has been focusing for the last uh, 60 with that. More than that, we started in 2004 as a, as a fully integrated uh, research institute within SAC with the help of many companies, sponsorship from either public agencies, uh, large corporations such as the MW from Germany, such as the EDF, uh, uh, a large uh, power uh, company like uh, Puig and Puig Telecom, uh, then Solexo, more recently La Poste, and many other uh, from both the manufacturing and the service industries, aiming to uh, sponsor research and events regarding uh, innovation strategies and innovation, innovation process <coughs> in a service slash experience driven economy. And we advocate, and not only us, but uh, uh, many of our colleagues over the world, advocate that in the 21st century, when manufacturing, a manufacturing company, we have to redefine the goal, the scope, and the practices in order to fit with the requirement of a service dominant economy. And it's different to, to design and manufacture something that has to be sold in a very traditional way. It's very difficult to do that. Then to design and manufacture something that is going to be used as uh, the basis for a sales, for a utility. You know, if, you, if, you sell, if, you, if you design and manufacture a bicycle to be sold, and if you design and manufacture a bicycle to be rented, like in Paris, like in many other cities where it's now very popular, you don't do the same object. The bicycle you design and manufacture for service economy is drastically different than the one you have been manufacturing for the traditional economy in which everything is based on the transfer of power. So we believe in the 21st century we have more and more and more situations all over the world where decisions will be made by the decision-making process to use, to rent, to lease, uh, rather than to buy equipment or product. And that has a drastic consequence on the way you define the innovation process, leading not only to the design of a tangible product, but to the design of an untangible experience associated with the physical support that is the product. So all of our work has been motivated by this idea of looking in depth of what it means at different levels for a purely service provider, for a manufacturing company, for a company operating in North America, for a company operating in Asia. What does it mean to deal with this new requirement of the economy? Uh, uh, since we do, well, kind of, uh, put together some kind of research. We do usually present our results regularly in event that we call the Matter de l'Innovation. So since uh, 19, uh, 2004, we have been uh, <coughs> uh, asking uh, not far from uh, 500 executives to come and discuss with us the different, uh, uh, their different um, their projects to expose the result of our study. And uh, we have decided to replicate and to localize this uh, sort of events in Asia. Starting with this matter uh, innovation. Matter innovation means morning. Well, it's morning in France, it's afternoon here. It's why we call it here uh, MasterCard, Innovation MasterCard class, because uh, uh, we will not uh, organize it in the morning if you want to have a <coughs> conference organization. We probably do it in the, the 
afternoon. And we are planning to regularly uh, organize this sort of uh, possible discussion on timely topics, such as the one we have picked for today, our multinational invest in R&D in Asia. What their strategy, why they are doing that, how they are doing that, what do they expect from it, and how possibly the whole landscape of research and development does evolve uh, in, in today's world. And it does evolve a lot. So in order to discuss the point, we have asked uh, three contributors uh, to, to present uh, three different papers uh, using a bit of order. First, uh, Xavier Barato, uh, uh, who's an engineer, like, of course it makes sense, I'm sure the three of them are engineers. And Xavier Barato has been working with ST uh, Microelectronics since 1997, right? Um, and at uh, current time, you, you are the Vice President of Packaging and Test Manufacturing for the Corporate Packaging and Automation Division. You will explain in more detail uh, what that is. Thank you very much for spending uh, the time, finding the time to be with us. Francis Lu is the Vice President for uh, R&D at TELES Solution Asia. Uh, initially, not an engineer, the real guy, a physicist, <coughs> with a degree from the Ecole Normale Supérieure, I think the French know what Normale Sup is, or the other that don't know, it's a very elitist scientific uh, <coughs> school, and uh, uh, in the South of France, what do you say? It's only a school in Chief Position. I was in the channel town ago, Shanghai, Rani, you're right, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Surely, um, uh, surely did into, into science, and then you go for the PhD in physics as well uh, in, before starting. Actually, a long time ago, uh, right? You have been you have been very uh, loyal to Thales, if I'm right, because you started with Thomson for a couple of years, and then since 2001, uh, you're working with Thales. And then Xavier Pereira, um, who is marketing director for Microsoft Asia Pacific, and you might ask, why marketing director? Well. We are talking about innovation and R&D, and we are talking about manufacturing and sales. And it's making a lot of sense not to uh, only work within the framework of one given culture, like technology for culture within the framework of manufacturing capital. It's important to address the issue with broader eyes. So uh, uh, the uh, value of being a marketing person from a service dominated industry also bringing uh, his contribution to, to the decision. So since I'm supposed to do, again, uh, 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 an introduction, <coughs> we'll take just an hour or two, no way. Uh, a few words just to, uh, about the topic. <coughs> That's a Singaporean, very strong, well designed. Uh, um, first of all, we all know that, and we want to have that in, in mind. R&D spending has grew and still grows. The growth is very significant despite the economic situation. Uh, in 2012, uh, uh, it's growing especially in emerging economy, a little less <coughs> in the uh, economically developed world. So in general, the curve is definitely positive, with obviously an effort made by all emerging countries, more or less, uh, we'll see the position of it. If you look at what it means, there are figures, and I'm sure that some are difficult to see it, but that's the largest world that we have. The US used to count for 32.8% of global effort in R&D by 2010, and it's staying somehow constant. 32% uh, 2011, and a little less uh, 31% in 2012. Asia uh, has moved from 34% <coughs> in 2010 to 35.5% uh, in 2011 to 36.7% by 2012, despite the economic situation that is uh, not in favor of of any of this uh, economy. Europe, Europe is very stable. 
talking about a slight, slightly negative stable stability. 24.8, 24.5, and 24.1. So it's stable, but slightly negative, and, and unfortunately. Right? If you look at uh, more <coughs> in depth in Asia, three uh, uh, very strong, very heavy economy. Japan, for far uh, the most uh, advanced economy in terms of spending on R and D uh, as a proportion of GDP, <coughs> makes uh, 14. Um, sorry, more makes 11.8 percent of the total global, and, and that corresponds to 148 billion dollars. By the way, China used to be behind. And in 2010, <coughs> China became actually uh, <coughs> the first in Asia. Right? It's a much larger country for sure, but that was the first time when actually they spent as a well, they, they were uh, contributed to the world effort in R&D at a rate slightly higher than, than, China, than uh, Japan, um, leading to 16.2% by 2012. 13.1% by 2007, so significantly raising. While Japan stays relatively stable, 11.4, 11.2. Uh, India is far behind in terms of uh, proportion, 2.8, 2.9, 2 2.9 again. But as we all know, very effective, very efficient in some particular domain. But they don't necessarily require a lot of investment. And I would say they do it well. Because we all understand that the output in any of the process to innovate is not only the result of how much money you pour in it. The capability, the way you do it, is sometimes much more important than actually the amount of money you are putting into the game. And one of the uh, corporate uh, examples that is very frequently given is well, sorry for not being very original. It's Apple. Apple for many years has invested significantly less in terms of dollars value and in terms of proportion of their uh, <coughs> uh, in R&D than many of its competitors. But they have done it better. They have done it in a smarter way. And they have done it in a way that was, in fact, uh, the entire company moving forward the process of innovation rather than to restrict innovation in only one uh, part or pocket of uh, the company. So except for Greece, all the countries that uh, uh, constitute the top 14 global R&D sponsors have increased the R&D budget in 2012, including Italy, Ireland, or Portugal. And we know that these countries are, are faced in 2012 are still face uh, a tremendous uh, economic challenge. The European Commission um, has established its uh, uh, investment program eight and is planning to uh, double the amount of research, uh, the amount of money invested into basic research by 2014, reaching 16 billion in uh, sponsorship for research in basic science. However, on the other hand, we know that the U.S. is still considered as leading in many technologies. McKinsey uh, wrote out a survey in 2011, results just published now, about what people feel in multinationals about <coughs> investing in R&D in emerging countries. Two-thirds of the executives uh, that were surveyed said their company are doing uh, are they in emerging countries? Which makes one third, I answer no. In the two thirds are already significant. They seem that most of them uh, try to align their goals, uh, whether they are looking for lower development costs or to gain better access to customer insights, something like that, with their specific R&D uh, focus in emerging economies. Now that they are doing research just for the sake of it, they are really trying to align things with what they are looking for, which makes a lot of sense. However, many managers at the top of R&D organizations are claiming that they are a bit 
disappointed by the performance of the top countries <coughs> of their research facilities in emerging countries. One of the reasons being that they say they are facing the problem of high specialization. Uh, outstanding research in one technological domain, difficulty to cross the uh, different domain, the one with the other, difficulty to establish an holistic vision of the uh, innovation output, difficulty to mix uh, service value with technological value, which today's world is critical for the success of any uh, innovation process. However, uh, when asked why they have uh, uh, decided to invest in r and in emerging countries, 44% in this survey are saying that even if, if it is less and less true, they initially decided to conduct research in emerging countries to get access to low cost. But not only low cost for doing research, also getting access to low cost solution associated with the project. 39% and growing are claiming that the key reason why they are doing R&D in emerging economy is to get customers insights, to get so sure that by being close to future customers, they will learn how to do things much better and uh, much uh, more relevant. In the US, the National Science Board uh, uh, expressed in 2012 uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, uh, most of North American origin of the multinational are locating more and more of their research operations overseas. And of course, Asian economies are <coughs> rapidly increasing in terms of uh, receiving the investment coming from uh, the countries. Also, and uh, the uh, US uh, NAC board uh, uh, noticed, the fact that Asian economies are significantly increasing their investment, their own investment in science and technology to try to become science and technology economies is perceived by the multinationals, in that particular case from America, as extremely appealing and justify uh, their interest in the US. The number of overseas researchers employed by the US multinational has doubled between 2004 to 2009. It's almost 2,070, uh, to, to 270,000 researchers uh, in 2009 employed by multi American multinational overseas. And of course, you look at what's going on in Europe and in Asia, the global funding growth is of course totally driven today by Asian economies. Asian R&D growth uh, expands, increased uh, 9%, uh, well, sorry, the increase in um, R&D growth in 2012 was 9% in Asia, this level of increase was only 3.5% in Europe, and the level of increase was only 2.8% in the US. China and India are the most common regional choice for R&D <coughs> destination. The main challenge seems to be the retention of qualified researcher. And uh, all high-performing innovators, almost all of them, are somehow conducting R&D in Asia. Uh, what's new while looking at the landscape of research and development in Asia is that, on the one hand, looking at the past 50 years, the economies in Asia have grew uh, astonishingly uh, uh, quickly, especially compared to, to Europe or even North America. But, in the last 15 years, uh, 50 years, Asian emerging market did not produce that many own innovations. However, today, especially for the last five to six years only, things are drastically changing. 
and more and more uh, just significant breakthrough innovation are emerging out of Asia, either being project being conducted by multinationals working in Asia or being conducted by Asian companies themselves. Now, to end up, how are uh, companies approaching Asia uh, to locate uh, R&D and to invest in R&D? Rational, and we'll see if uh, uh, our uh, contributors agree with that, what usually it says is the following. First, uh, except in some cases, the rational to invest in Asia for R&D has shifted from cost to competences. More and more, companies say what we are looking for in Asia are the skills, the talent, the competences, which is already new in existence. Second, <coughs> Many are feeling that they have to be there to capture market opportunity. But they're not going to do research to sell product. But they feel like by developing product in Asia, they are able to develop product that will capture a significant part of the market <coughs> later on. And this product could not be developed in another place because the needs are in Asia. Then in order to capture future market opportunity, research has to be done. Some are saying that they invest in R&D as a defensive measure. What do you mean by defensive measure? They feel like, again, disruptive innovation <coughs> might take place more and more, or might emerge more and more in Asia. Which means, if we are not there, we might miss a lot of this uh, disruptive innovation that might drastically change the way we do business in many industries in the future. And many believe that highly elegant solution at low cost are easier to develop in Asia than they would be in some part of the world. And we are looking for elegant solution, low cost. More and more R&D in Asia seem to shift from product localization to development process, which means in the past, Many research centers in the region would localize, customize, adapt product to the regional need. And it seems like today that's no longer the real thing. Uh, the research centers in Asia are taking full responsibility of on telling you product development. The localization time seems to be a bit away. Uh, it seems also that in Asia, Many companies feel that center of excellence are developed to address the need of emerging markets in general. Meaning, if you want to be successful in Latin America, if you want to take advantage of the uh, suggested new growth of Africa, you need special solutions. And these solutions are developed in Asia. Uh, the center of excellence focusing on satisfying the needs of the demanding areas of Asia are uh, providing solutions that could be uh, used, uh, duplicated in other emerging markets. <coughs> companies are also recognizing that the process companies use to pursue innovations in emerging markets is different to the process they usually have been using in the established <coughs> market. And they more and more uh, get the feeling that the process they have been using are no longer appropriate. Which means more they develop R&D in Asia, more they work at re-engineering <coughs> the way they do research in their home base, being North America or Europe. Uh, something that is uh, uh, also noticed is that the focus of R&D Center in Asia is more on product development than on pure science development, making a lot of sense. However, it might slightly change. And the most advanced uh, player in the area, especially, you know, we think with Japan, Singapore, with uh, Taiwan, uh, <coughs> again, South Korea a little bit, 
are investing a lot also in pure science. However, pure, pure science is not exactly innovation, it's what takes place before innovation. That's also going probably to, to change a lot. And finally, I have two comments. The companies are saying that uh, in order to locate the R&D centers in Asia, the so <coughs> other uh, uh, writing um, uh, considerations is about the availability of the really skilled workers. And it seems to, to be key, surveys after surveys, this notion of getting access to the right type of engineers and scientists uh, is key for the, for the location. Which means some places that used to be this center, like, like Beijing, like Bangalore, other places that used to be regional center for innovation, are no longer perceived as a place to be. Because it's becoming too difficult to hire the right people and too expensive as well. And new places in Asia are emerging where precisely uh, you could get access to uh, people a bit, uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, easy time. And the last thing is, surprisingly, government incentive. You would expect government incentive to be key. <laughs> Tax reduction and so on. And they say, well, it's, it has a limited importance. In fact. What's more important is really about government policy regarding, for instance, education. Something like Andrew has perfectly well understood and deployed some of the last Government policy to support higher education and policies to promote technology adoption within the society are perceived as more important than uh, tax package, uh, tax division. Well, of course, they are going to take. It's not that we don't like it, but we don't like it. Like but in order to make a decision, they come second. First, are really about you know, how the educational infrastructure and the educational uh, the resource infrastructure really uh, is worked out in a way to the city. In Asia, are uh, taking full responsibility of, I'm telling you, product development. The localization time seems to be a bit away. Uh, it seems also that in Asia, many companies feel that center of excellence are developed to address the need of emerging markets in general. Meaning, if you want to be successful in Latin America, if you want to take advantage of the uh, suggested new growth of Africa, you need special solutions. And these solutions are developed in Asia. Uh, the center of excellence focusing on satisfying the needs of the demanding areas of Asia are uh, providing solutions that could be uh, used, uh, duplicated in other emerging markets. <coughs> companies are also recognizing that the process companies use to pursue innovations in emerging markets is different to the process they usually have been using in the established <coughs> market. And they more and more uh, get the feeling that the process they have been using are no longer appropriate, which means more they develop their own in Asia, more they work at really <coughs> the way they do research in their home base in North America or Europe. Uh, something that is uh, uh, also noticed is that the focus of R&D Center in Asia is more on product development than on pure science development, making a lot of sense. However, it might slightly change and the most advanced uh, player in the area, especially, you know, we think with Japan, Cuba, Singapore, with uh, Taiwan, uh, <coughs> and South Korea, we could are investing a lot also in pure science. However, pure, pure science is not exactly innovation, it's what takes place before innovation. That's also going probably to, to change a lot. And finally, I have two comments. The companies are saying that uh, in order to locate the R&D centers in Asia, the so <coughs> other uh, uh, writing um, uh, considerations is about the availability of the really skilled workers. And it seems to, to be key, 
surveys after surveys, this notion of getting access to the right type of engineers and scientists uh, is key for the, for the location. Which means some places that used to be this center, like, like Beijing, like Bangalore, other places that used to be regional center for innovation are no longer perceived as a place to be. Because it's becoming too difficult to hire the right people and too expensive as well. And new places in Asia are emerging where precisely uh, you could get access to uh, people a bit, uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, easy time. And the last thing is, surprisingly, government incentive. We would expect government incentive to be key, tax reduction and so on. And they say, well, it's, it has a limited importance. What's more important is really about government policy regarding, for instance, education. Something like Andrew has perfectly well understood and deployed over the last lesson. Government policy to support higher education and policies to promote technology adoption within the society are perceived as more important than uh, tax package, uh, tax division. Well, of course, they are good to take. It's not that <coughs> like we don't like it, but we like it. But in order to make a decision, they come second. First, are really about you know, how the educational infrastructure and the educational uh, the resource infrastructure really uh, is worked out in a way to best. There are some of the findings in the recent research. A lot of things we could say about what the future will be about. I think we'll keep it for later. I think it's already time, more than time, <coughs> to give to Consoluc and Thales the floor. Thank you very much. <laughs>